Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really very honored to be giving a Google talk. It's exciting for me. I was looking forward to this for quite a long time. And we're going to talk today about the surprising power of fear. And I could have never imagined the things that Elaine had mentioned. If you look in the background, that's me actually going down uh, the, across one of the glaciers in Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. And I could have never even imagined that 15 years ago. So I'm here to share a little bit of that journey. <clears throat> Before we get started, tell me who today has made a decision based on fear? Raise your hands. Okay, who in the past week has made a decision based on fear? Okay, so if you think about it, I think we've got a very confident group here, uh, or there might be a little bit of a, uh, a confidence bias. If you think about the reason you stopped at a red light this morning on your way into work, walking into work or biking into the work, was the motivation behind that fear or something else? There's only two motivations in your decision making. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So according to Dr. Siren Pilly at Harvard, 88% of us harbor hidden fears. And of course, if you ask anyone, no, I don't have any hidden fears because they're hidden or else they wouldn't have them. So we're going to explore that a little bit today because it affects your emotions. And if you look at Jane here, so you're not Mr. Perfect, Brad, but marriage means more to me than love ever could. So she has some hidden fears, obviously, of being abandoned and that sort of thing. The latest research that we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have available to us shows that the only way to conquer fear is to find more of it. Most people don't realize that, that to really tame fear, you have to find more of it. So there's only two choices you have. You can either tame fear or fear can tame you. There's no in between. Ripping the lid off those hidden fears will dramatically change your life. They're going to change your emotions. They'll change how you deal with your colleagues at work. They'll change how you deal with your friends and family. And they'll change how you feel about yourself. So today I'm going to go into a three-step framework using the latest neuroscience that's going to help you rip the lid off those hidden fears and learn how to use that fear as fuel. That's the exciting part, is when you can get to the point where that fear doesn't become something you avoid, but rather it becomes a source of fuel for you. So it's going to make you happier, it's going to make you more successful, and it's going to bring about world peace. And I'll cover that in about 30 minutes. Now you Googlers should be impressed because the Dalai Lama it takes about an hour to get to his world speech part. I'm going to do it in half the time, so it's 50% more efficient, even though the Lama is a big hitter. So my mission has been to bring fear to people and to help people find more of it. I've worked with CEOs, professional athletes, U.S. Special Forces, and we found some amazing things. I'm going to share that with you. One of the things that's clear is we all have a gift, and that gift is inside, and oftentimes fear keeps it locked in to people. So I'm going to start out today, before we get into the science, with a gift for all of you. Whenever I come to a new country, I like to do something to celebrate the culture. So I'm going to sing Frere Jacques, kind of a traditional Swiss lullaby, but I can't sing. So we're a little pressed for time. I usually ask for volunteers, but Elaine said uh, we don't have so much time. So I'm going to pick five people from the audience to come up and sing with me. And I'm going to start out with you, sir, in the... Gray shirt, ma'am, you with the, the kind of cranberry colored shirt back there, and ma'am back there with the, the flowered shirt on. Yes, please, come on up. Yeah, come on, come on right up here. And sir, with the glasses on, please come over here. Ma'am, even though you're not looking at me, I can still see you, come on. <laughs> come on up, you'll be our last one. Okay, now, we have these five folks, uh, if I could ask your name. Andres. Andres. Yana, Maria, Maria? Sandra, Sander? Yep. Juana, Juana? Andrea. Andrea. Okay, so we've got these six folks up here who either are going to become the stars of Google because this is going out to hundreds of thousands of people who will see it all over the world, all over Google's organization, everywhere. So they're either going to be tremendous stars or they're going to be looking for work, looking for a new spouse and partner and living in some shack in the woods because they embarrass themselves so badly. So 
Don't think about that, though. What I want you to think about is just what we're going to do. Okay, come, come on in a little closer. On three, we're going to one, one, two, three, frère Jacques, frère Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous. You all know, that, know the words, right? Okay, so we're going to start out. One, two, three, four. Oh, no, I can't believe you guys thought I was actually going to make you sing. Okay, nobody's going to sing up here. And if you're in the audience and you are thinking you might get picked, I want you to stop right now and answer the same question I'm going to ask these guys. How do you feel? How do you feel? Relieved. There, you feel relieved. <laughs> a second ago, a second ago, how did you feel? Let's say before you felt relieved, how'd you feel? Ridiculous, okay. And when you say you felt ridiculous, where in your body did you feel ridiculous? Can you in pinpoint, mind. where? In my mind. In your mind. Can you pinpoint a physical location? No? Okay. Who else, who else felt nervous or embarrassed? Okay. Well, we've got, every, so let's, uh, let's start down here. Where did you feel it? Shaking. <laughs> you're all shaking. Your hands are shaking. We can see, yes. we can see that here. Okay, so your whole body's shaking. Yes. That's awesome. And you? I had no idea what song you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, you, did. you didn't know what song I was talking but she was still ready to sing. God love you. Good for you. And where do you feel it physically? Is there some place in your body? Somewhere here. It, uh, just like kind of in your heart, in your stomach, and yeah. that sort of thing. And you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tight, tight jaw, tight shoulders. Yeah, I mean, Maybe also trembling a bit. Trembling in the, in the knees. Yes. A little Elvis leg, right? You can't get the leg to stop. Okay, well, give them a round of applause, please. Have a seat. Thank you very much. So if you were in the audience and you were afraid you were going to get picked, what I want you to think about is where you felt it. Stop for a second and think physically where you had it. Do we have any poker players in the room? Anyone who plays poker? No? Does anyone know what a tell is? What's a tell? Yes? Um, it's when you give away your, th that you're saying something, I don't know what you're thinking. It's, it's, a, it's a subconscious um, gesture, behavior, motion that you do when you have something good. So poker players call this a tell. You might, you might pull on your ear, you might straighten out your your shirt sleeve, or there's something you might do that can give away the fact that you've got a good hand. That's called a tell in poker. Every single person has a fear tell. We have a way that fear manifests itself in your body, and that grows depending on the level of fear. We're going to talk about that in a little bit because it's important that you start to understand your fear tells because they start to give you messages. When you see an email, from one of your colleagues or your boss, and you start to feel that tell. Maybe you'll feel it right there, and it, where uh, I think it was Andreas was saying he felt it a little bit. Or maybe you'll feel it down in your legs, but you start to recognize those tells. Most people do a lot to avoid that. And I want to tell you to be the best version of you and to let out everything you have and not make decisions based on fear. You want to find more of that. So it's, it's taken me an awful long time to figure out the neuroscience behind it because I've interviewed over 35 leading neuroscientists from MIT, Harvard, Tufts, Trinity, all over the world. And some of the technology we have just in the past five years has allowed us to have a look into the brain and understand how some of this works. I had a hidden fear and I didn't recognize it until it was almost too late. Elaine mentioned that I had started a few technology companies. So I was a CEO of a venture-backed company. We were really hot and successful in the software space. And I was working 70 or 80 hours a week. Typical VC-backed type of CEO. And I was going out every night to these networking events and CEO events and, and private equity events. And I was drinking six or seven beers every night when I went out. And then I come back at about midnight or so and I'd feel guilty, it's that whole Irish Catholic thing, right? Like, you're a redhead, you get that. So it was crazy. And I woke up one morning, went to the gym, just like you guys probably do here. Went into the gym, hey, Swain, how you doing? Good, gonna work arms today. Started working arms, ooh, boy, that arm hurts a little bit. All right, well, I'll just do a little cardio, get on the machine. Then the next day, I got in, woke up, same thing, starting to feel really bad. And I thought, wow. I should go to the doctor and get this checked out. And I didn't. Can anyone guess why? 
I was afraid to go to the doctor. Yeah, yeah, I was afraid to get the bad news. Third day woke up, I could barely move the arm. I said, I gotta go to the doctor now. So I went to the doctor and he looked at it and he said, you know, it looks like a staph infection. That's pretty common among guys who spend a lot of time in the gym and working out. So we're gonna give you some antibiotics and we're gonna take a few blood tests. The nurse will call you back in the afternoon. I said, okay, good, thanks. <laughs> well, the nurse didn't call me back. The doctor did. And that's when my life changed. He said, I don't know what it is, and we can't figure it out here in you know, our little hospital in Virginia. We're gonna send you up to Johns Hopkins, one of the top hospitals in the world. So I got the express ticket to the Johns Hopkins mat matinee for leukemia patients. And I went up there and I got checked in and I got put into this bed and I had a one-year-old daughter at the time. And I had uh, my wife who was six months pregnant with me, who was just white as a ghost, stressed out as you could be. I had more tubes and wires plugged in me than the space shuttle just about to lift off. And I'm sitting in this bed and all of a sudden, Dr. McDevitt walks in, he takes two steps inside the door, looks across the room. There were three kids behind him who I thought were the kids he must coach in the soccer team after work because they didn't look a day older than 12. And he stopped and he turned to look at them and he said, oh wow, this is really interesting. This guy's T cells went rogue and started attacking the rest of his white blood cells. He's got no immune system. And he's talking like I wasn't even there. I'm like, hey, doc. Yeah, but the good news is I got the first colonoscopy in the morning. And he didn't even laugh. He came over and he sat down. And he said, look, we're going to do a lot of tests. We're going to try and figure some of this stuff out. But are your affairs in order? Now, I'm no Doogie Hauser, But when a doctor asks you if your affairs are in order, you're pretty much screwed. Does anyone not know who Doogie Howser is, by the way? Oh, God, I hate all you people. You missed the Dalai Lama joke, too, from Caddyshack. Does anyone know any 80s trivia? Who knows the 80s trivia? Stay with me. Someone. Anyone. Okay. All right. Couple people. All right. Doogie Howser was a, a prodigy doctor who was like 12 years old as a doctor. So. so anyways, they started figuring stuff out, and it didn't look good at all. It was a really rare form of leukemia. I had no immune system, and my body was being attacked con constantly. I sat there, and, and like uh, Elaine said, I had spent five years training for the Olympics. My first Olympic trials, I finished 14th. The second Olympic trials, I finished second. The difference between those two was I did a ton of mental training. I was in Colorado Springs at the US Olympic Training Center learning how to use my mind to get my body faster. So when I sat in there in Hopkins, and they were telling me there's not much they think they can do, and they've never seen something like this before. I said, okay, well, there's something I gotta do. I sat there day and night imagining these warrior cells coming out of my body and attacking those rogue T cells. And I just sat there and I envisioned it day in and day out for two weeks, my body building up these warrior cells. And I had the greatest doctors in the world, and I kept doing that, and not to give away the ending, but I died. I didn't die, I'm here. I lived. And when I got out of the hospital at Hopkins, I walked out and it was in the worst part of Baltimore. It's in a ghetto area, it's really run down. And I walked out and I saw this leaf in a puddle. And it was red and tinged with gold around the outside. And I would have never even stopped before this all had happened. I stopped and I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's really beautiful. I know it sounds cliche, but it was like this gratitude switch got flipped on in my head. And all I could think about was how awesome it was to be alive and how much I had wasted my life worrying about fear, being afraid of everything. And I didn't even know how afraid I was of all the things that were going on in my life until I got out of that hospital and I faced my real fear. When I faced that real fear, I realized fear was a fraud, complete fraud. I found this study from Cornell University called the Legacy Study. What they did was they interviewed thousands of people between the age of 70 and 109. And they said, we want to collect the wisdom of our elders. So they asked them a bunch of questions, asked them for their best advice. There was only one thing 
of the thousands of people that was common among just about all of them. And that was that they wished they had spent less time worrying. They wished they had spent less time in their life in fear. Because fear is all about the future or something bad that happened in the past. So if you're living in the present and you're enjoying the moment, you can't be in a fearful state. Fear is like a, it's like a Rottweiler. You get a little Rottweiler puppy, you can throw it in a cage and you can occasionally toss some scraps. That thing won't, won't be able to hold itself back if you let it out because it's going to tear at your flesh just to get something to eat. If you take that same Rottweiler and you care for it and you bring it into the family and you feed it and you train it, that thing will do whatever it takes to keep your family safe. It'll become your best friend. Fear is the exact same way, but most of us do our best to ignore it. So I want everyone to stand up for just a second, pretend you're that Rottweiler, <laughs> shake it out. Okay, now I'm going to let everyone in on a secret. And this is one of the key fear secrets to start with. You are going to die. And 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 we're all going to die. I want everyone to repeat after me, I will die. I will die. Louder, I will die. I will die. <laughs> One more time, I will, I will die. Okay, now is anyone unclear about that? <laughs> All right, sit down, because now we can live. Now, if you're afraid of dying, and that's one of the biggest fears in the world, no matter what your spirituality is, there's no argument. We're going to go back to wherever we came from. So I want everyone to close their eyes for a second, especially if you're afraid of dying. And I want you to think about yourself dying right now. If you're afraid to get up here on stage and be embarrassed or feel ridiculous, I want you to think about that right now. All of those things happened in your mind. That was a movie you played in your mind. And fear is always a horror movie. So think about the worst movie you can think of right now, standing on the edge of a cliff, getting thrown in water with a bunch of great white sharks. Whatever your biggest fear is, think about it now and try and feel the sensations in your body that are changing. Feel where you're feeling it in your belly, in your hips, in your chin, in your jaw, in your knees, anywhere you're feeling that. Now, here's what I want you to do when you feel that for the next time. Take a deep breath in to a count of four, Hold it for a count of four, and let it out for a count of four. In, two, three, four. Hold it, two, three, four. <sighs> two, three, four. In, three. Hold it, two, three, four. Oh, two, three, four. If you keep that rhythm up, when you get in a fear state, I'll explain a little bit of the science behind it, you change from having an erratic heartbeat which if you looked on an EKG is a heartbeat that looks like a silhouette of mountains to having a coherent heartbeat, which is just a nice sine wave. That allows you to take over your sympathetic nerve system again because it gets hijacked when you get in a fearful state and you stop thinking correctly. Just that breathing, that four by four, is a great way to get you. So the first step in this three-step framework is to start to recognize your fear tells. Start to figure out what your body does so you can, you can take control over it and you can get back in control. So I was terribly serious about the world peace part. I think if I can teach millions of people to tame their fear, we can have world peace. Because I believe what Gandhi said. He said, hate isn't the enemy. Fear is the enemy. And if we can all understand fear and learn to tame it and use it as a fuel, we can get to a place of world peace. So to understand fear, you have to understand what I refer to as a fear frontier. Because we've got a battle going on inside our brains. I call it the battle of the brains. And it has to do with two primary glands within your brain. The first one is the amygdala. It's a little almond-shaped gland that sits at the base of your brain. And it handles the three Fs. Anyone know what the three Fs are when you get scared? Fight is one. Anyone else? Fight. Fight, flight. The third one? Freeze. freeze, exactly. So the amygdala is what controls the fight, flight, or freeze response. So that is the gland that, that saves us from saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths. 
It's been there since the beginning of time. What we didn't realize was that jumping at the first sign of rustling grass or freezing like a deer in the headlights every time someone made a loud noise didn't exactly make us the best dinner guest. So over the past 50,000 years or so, we developed something called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the adult supervision for the brain. What happens in a normal state, when we're sitting here right now, the prefrontal cortex is in charge, for most of us anyways. Not for me, because I'm scared to death being up here talking to you guys. But the, the prefrontal cortex, you can see here, handles your world when you're chilled, when you're maybe a little bit uneasy, but then when you start to get high on the anxiety scale, on the dread scale, all the way up to terror, the amygdala takes over. And the amygdala is only making up stories about fear. You can't measure fear. You can measure risk, right? Risk is, of the, all the people in this room, in our lifetime, there's gonna be seven people in this room who die of, of uh, car crashes. If we took this same size room and we multiplied it times 50 times, we'd find one person who would die in a plane crash. That's risk, we understand that, that's data driven. Fear is different for all of us because it's not, it's not real, it doesn't exist, we make it up in our mind. It's almost like risk is on one end of the solar system over here in Mercury, and fear comes out of the other end of the solar system from Uranus. That was a joke. That's why my 10 and 11 year old boys love my jokes when I throw them in the presentation. The truth is, fear is a joke. There is no real basis for any kind of fear. So if we can learn to take this prefrontal cortex and bring it over here and make it in control when you're doing it, this is exactly the kind of courage that special forces train for. And they do it in just one realm and they need to do it in three realms. I told you, there's two ways to make decisions. One is based on fear. The other is based on opportunity. If you think about every major decision you've made in your life, to come to work at Google, to move to Zurich, to uh, get in, in a serious relationship, any major decision you've made in your life, you've made it either out of fear or out of opportunity. Out of opportunity comes growth and gratitude. And those are the two pillars for happiness. That's why understanding fear and taming fear can make you happier. I mentioned my two uh, 10 and 12 year old boys for a reason when I was talking about the amygdala. For anyone who has children or anyone who's a teacher or who's working with kids who are under 25 years old, this is critical to know. The amygdala is fully developed at birth. So they have the fight, flight, and freeze response when you're born, because that saves you from the charging woolly mammoth. The prefrontal cortex, that doesn't get fully developed until most people are in their mid-20s. So think about that when you're in a situation where all of a sudden a kid starts screaming and you can't figure out why, why, you know, why can't you just think rationally about this? Because he doesn't have the capability to think rationally yet. So someone who's under 25, needs to be trained to create the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala so that prefrontal cortex can take control. And there's three things, three types of fear that we're gonna address here, but the important thing is even after you're 25 years old, you can still change, you can still create courage because of something called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity has only recently been proven with some of the new technology we have, but basically, your mind can change at any age. And that's what happened to me when I finally faced my fear frontier. So what I'm hoping everyone here can do is figure out what their fear frontier is and move that out. And the further you move that fear frontier out, the more in control of your life you are and the happier you're gonna be. If you understand the three fears that exist, number one is physical. So we talked about US Navy SEALs, and I've worked with them in the past, and they are tremendous in terms of physical courage. And what they do is they've got this courage factory in Coronado, California, called Basic Underwater Demolition School, or BUDS. And SEALs go there for six weeks. They take the, they take the strongest and bravest candidates from the normal Navy, and they bring them to BUDS. Now, it's not surprising the average age of a Navy SEAL going through BUDS is 21 years old. 
right? So they're getting them before that, that connection is fully developed. And they ratchet up the amount of physical fear that they get put in every day until the seals start to realize that when they get that reaction, when they start to feel the same trembling knees, the butterflies in the stomach, the tight jaw, they can say, okay, this is our fuel. This is energy. We're going to get something on. We're going to kick some ass. And anyone can learn to do that. One of the challenges some of the Navy SEALs I've worked with have is they only learn to do it in the physical realm. There's also emotional fears and instinctual fears, as you can see from this graph. And like any other fear, like any other skill, you have to practice courage in those instances. You've got to understand what it's like because what happens when you hit your fear frontier is cowardice begets cowardice. My biggest fear was dead center in, in the middle of this. It's flying. I saw a plane crash, uh, Delta DC-9, when I was six years old. All 100 people on board died. I was terrified to fly. I had my entire life locked away from me for 30 years, and I didn't know it. And that planted a seed of cowardice that crept through my whole body. I was a kid in high school who was afraid to go to sleep at night without the light on. And that's how bad it was. So my biggest fear became flying. But then, after I got out of the hospital, all I could imagine was my one-year-old daughter. And would I have to be the guy who was remembered by his daughter as being too afraid to get on a plane and take her to Disney World? And I said, man, there's no way I want that to be what I remember. So I decided to go mano a mano with my flying fear. And that changed my whole life. And what happens from a physical perspective, this is a great example of the type of technology we've had in the past five years. This is from Dr. Anna Byler, who used to be at MIT, who just opened up the Neuroscience Center in Bordeaux. And what you're going to see now is a mouse's amygdala creating a pathway to the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex coming back in the other direction. So what this shows more than anything else, what this shows is how amazing the technological advances have been in just the past five years. But what you're seeing here is that pathway connecting between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex means that those neurons are firing together often. And neurons that fire together wire together. So that brain that you just saw was creating a highway of courage. And the more that those neurons fire together, the easier it becomes for that pathway to fire together. So the more in control that the prefrontal cortex can become. That's the second step of this three-part framework. That second step is to scare yourself at least once a week. So you can start to bring those feelings up and start to control them. And ideally, you scare yourself at a higher and a higher level and you start to get in control, and you wire that pathway between your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex. Our bodies were designed for physical stress over thousands and thousands of years, and we live in such a stress-free world. We avoid stress, and we've never lived in a safer time in human history. Right? We don't, even, we don't even walk upstairs anymore. We stand on an escalator or we take an elevator. We don't even carry our bags in the airport. We drag them behind us on wheels. Right? We try and do everything we can to avoid stress. The problem is our bodies are wired for stress. So we have to find more of it. And that's step three, is we want to build this courage. We understand there's neuroplasticity. It can happen at any time. All this can be easier if you create the right environment the right foundation for it. And that's what I call fear fitness. So the three steps are to learn your fear tells, scare yourself once a week, and then stress your body three to five times a week. The easiest way to do this is with aerobic exercise. It gets better if you add in strength or some form of agility. Rock climbing is a great example of that, or dancing. And then lastly, there's so much new data around what happens if you go back to environmental stress. I tell everyone the easiest thing to do is take a cold shower in the morning. In the first week, it sucks. And everyone in here, everyone I've ever said said, no, 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 other people can do that. I can't take a cold shower. <laughs> and everyone says the same thing, but you can. And after a week or two, it actually becomes pretty easy to do, but you're training your body to handle those environmental stresses. I run in the wintertime with just a pair of shorts on. 
And it's, it's a type of stress that our body needs because our gen genetic array has been aligned for very specific instances and very specific stresses. And if we're not using those, it's almost like a, like a, a race car. You know, Ferrari's sitting there with all these tubes and has all these washers in them, but because it never gets run, the washers get all dry rotted and they stop working. That's what your immune system goes through when you go through those stresses. That's what almost killed me because I was living that life of burying my fears with beer every night and 80 hours a week. So the other thing that just came out in the past six weeks that's really interesting is your diet plays a tremendous role in your courage and your happiness as well. So if you have the right gut bacteria, if you eat yogurt and sauerkraut and kimchi and the things that develop the good bacteria in your gut, it's quicker to shut off your amygdala. So it makes the circuits to turn the, the fear response off much quicker. And that's data that's just come out literally in the past six weeks. So there's so much amazing stuff around how to live a courageous life. Now what I want to do, that's the, the three-step framework. I want to give you the five fatal fears that we see a lot in corporations. So you can use this to become authentic, courageous leaders. And this is from, like Elaine said, working with a lot of CEOs throughout the world and a lot of government organization. We've seen five fatal fears that are, that are pretty prevalent. First and foremost is the fear of the unknown. You see this a ton in mergers and acquisition, right? When people acquire something, they say, okay, uh, you know, we, we want to keep the status quo. It's called a status quo bias. You also see it in market leaders too. Kodak is a perfect example. Kodak was such a huge successful company and they said, well, we don't know anything about this, this digital revolution. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to get into it. We're going to sit back and see. So fear of the unknown. The second is fear of rejection or fear of rejection from the tribe is what it boils down to. The only reason anyone would feel ridiculous standing up here about to sing, nothing, change, nothing changes in your world. There's, you're no in, not in physical danger. There's no reason that you should have any reaction, except we're programmed instinctually to stick with the tribe because it's safer. 100,000 years ago, if you got rejected from the tribe, that meant certain death. You couldn't live. Today, it doesn't mean that at all. Today, oftentimes, in fact, it means you're, you're an innovator because you don't want to be stuck with groupthink or the sunflower management that some people refer to, which is, which is just like you, you do whatever the leader wants you to do so you can keep him happy or her happy. So it's crazy. Uh, apophenia is the second one, or the, sorry, the third one. Apophenia is finding patterns where patterns don't exist. This is most easily seen when someone has had a few successes and they get what's called the, the winner bias or the success bias, and they aren't given the same scrutiny or their projects aren't given the same analysis that other projects were because maybe they had one or two successful ones. The fourth one is a tickophobia, and that is basically the fear of failure. It, it comes down to something called a stability bias. We see this more times in careers than we necessarily see it in companies, but we see people who have a tremendous skill set and they don't want to do it because they're afraid they might fail and they have something good already. I use my brother every now and again as an example because he's such a great artist. He's a federal agent and he does law enforcement for the U.S. government from nine to five. He's pretty good at his job. He rushes home to build custom motorcycles and he spends all weekend at swap meets and going to shows and he sold his motorcycles in Japan, all over the U.S., throughout Europe and I've said to him a bunch of times, Sean, you ought to do that for a living. You'd be making millions of dollars doing what you love. It's, ah, no, I got 15 years and I'll get my pension and then I can do it full time. And I see that all the time and that's the fear of failure. People are looking for that stability. If you ever hear someone saying they're working for the weekend, right? I can't wait for the weekend. It means they have the wrong job. You have the right job when you're able to combine your passion with your vocation, and that's what I call your genius. If you can spend every day in your genius, you love coming to work. You love doing what you're doing, working with the team you're working with. If you don't, you're being held back because of a fear decision that you made, not an opportunity decision. The fifth one is a fear of loss, and we see this with sales teams all the time. 
a lot of sales guys will come from meager backgrounds, families that, that maybe never had gone to college, never made a lot of money, and they'll start making $150,000 a year, and they'll buy the Porsche, and they'll join the country club. And these guys start to get pushed from their, their VP of sales or their CEO. They say, okay, you can do way more than this. And they could. They could do million dollar years. They could really have an incredible life that, that they only dreamed of. But all of a sudden, when they hit a certain level, they think, what if I lose the Porsche? What if I lose the big house? What if I lose the country club? So we see this a lot with sales guys having fear of loss. And again, it's, it's a decision based on fear, not on opportunity. So I'm going to share one more tool that I put up on the web uh, for you guys. And this is a great way, especially with your teams or with your personal decisions, to make a decision. This is from the Stoics over 2,300 years ago. And it's called, I love the name, Premeditation of Evil. So when you get trouble or you get scared, a lot of people say, oh, go to your safe place. Go to your happy place. That's the worst thing you can do. You want to go to the evil place. You want to go someplace where you absolutely think of the worst scenario possible. And then you want to see that, that happening and you want to create the mitigation for it, the likely results, and then that brings you a whole new level of confidence. And this is, this is done by Marcus Aurelius, who's a, a famous Stoic who made this famous years and years ago. And there's a whole process that we use with corporations to do it. But it's a great way to start taking control of life. Because life only happens two ways. Life can either happen to you if you're making decisions based on fear, and that means you're a victim. Or life can happen by you, and you're the author of your life. And that means every decision you're making is based on an opportunity, not because of fear. So I made this transformation for flying. And when I got out of the hospital, I decided to get my private pilot's license. And I fell in love with flight. And I couldn't believe for 30 years this had been completely locked away from me. So I got my instrument rating so I could fly in any weather. And then I went on and got my commercial pilot's license. And I wondered how many other people are living in fear and having the greatest joy of their life locked away from them because of a fear. So that's when I started trying to convince other people to go out and find their, their fear. So now the, the kid who was afraid, who would cry every time I saw an airplane, is this guy here. This is the Green Mountain Valley Aerobatics School, uh, Aerobatics Contest in Vermont last year. And I have more fun doing this and flying on the water, in aerobatics, doing all sorts of different stuff. And I was just amazed that this has been held away for so long from me. And if you ever get scared of heights or anything else, let me know. I'll take you up for a flight. This, so I got second in this aerobatics competition last summer in Vermont. And I know someone out there is saying, well, if this fear stuff works so good, why didn't you get first? So you try pulling five Gs with your stomach trying to duck out of your sphincter and let me know how easy it is, because it's tough, but it's so easy. And I would have never known, I would have been hidden away. I would have never traveled to, to all the places that I travel. I would have never done all the stuff that I do with my fear. So what I'd ask you is, what is holding you prisoner? from your greatest joy. What fears are influencing the decisions that you make? So now I got one last thing. I want everyone to stand up one more time. And we're gonna take the courage code together. I want you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I will scare myself once a week. I will scare myself once a week. Very good. I will extend my fear frontier. I will face life with courage. I will make decisions based on opportunity. And I will lead with bravery. When you do, I promise your life will change and you'll have such an amazing life. And what's in here will come out to share with everyone else. Thank you all very much. I'm Patrick Sweeney. Good night. <laughs>